name and everybody said amen hallelujah turn to your neighbor and tell them that jesus is lord before you're seated turn to both neighbors say jesus is lord and say it with a note of victory when you have a victory note you can actually hear noise so say it one more time jesus is lord can you say that out loud say jesus is lord praise the lord hallelujah well did you bring your bibles with you this morning praise the lord i'm not getting a response i'm not even getting a yes from just a couple people so if i could just hear everybody on the count of three say yes uh, a little bit better one two three all right praise that sounds a lot better so did you bring your bibles today okay a few of you did amen do you have your phones with the bible on it all right praise the lord i want you to follow with me if you would uh, in the scriptures, we're going to uh, start reading in Isaiah, the 54th chapter and the first verse. I'm going to read to you out of the message translation. So if you could put that up on the screen this morning, I want to talk to you about uh, the shift. There's a shift. We prophesied about that in the last Holy Ghost service. If you weren't here, you can go online and uh, uh, you can listen to that again. But uh, there is a, a move of God that's taking place. There is a shift that's taking place in the body of Christ. And I want to embrace that. So we're talking today about embracing the move of God. And uh, we're going to subtitle this, Beware of the Leaven. <laughs> so it'll be a little bit of an uh, interesting message today. We'll turn a few corners, but uh, everybody say that with me. Beware of the Leaven. And so let's start by talking about this shift. I really believe God is bringing us into a new, fresh uh, direction, not just individually, but I think as a church, there's some really good, big, large uh, things coming for us um, in many different aspects. I do know this, and you can just feel this. There, there's going to be a, a change of locations. I mean, we're not going to be in this building very long, and there's kind of a, a squeezing going on in the natural. As you can see, we have been squeezed out of our foyer. We've been squeezed out of some other rooms. Mind you, we are, you know, using this facility for free this time. We did not renew our lease. You know, just to talk a little bit about some church business. We didn't renew our lease because we knew we wouldn't be here more than two years anyway. Um, God wants us to uh, get out of any kind of fishbowl in life. You know, if you stay in a fishbowl, you'll stay, you'll stay a certain size. And uh, I've just known in my spirit, you know, even with that, there's some good things coming. So get ready for that. Embrace that. Be ready. And it uh, will take some uh, change and it won't be a step backwards it will be a step forward um, there's some other things the Lord's laid on my heart you know that we've had our eye on uh, concerning property and land and buildings uh, we're not so sure if it's going to be land or if it's going to be an existing building to purchase whatever the Lord has you know we don't know all right now and that's okay I don't have to know all I just know in my spirit just concerning that, there's a shift going on. And any time the Lord turns a corner, moves, uh, you, know, it, you know, in a new direction, a fresh direction, it's always going to be a higher direction. The Bible says uh, that we're changed from glory to glory. So one degree of glory to another degree of glory. One degree of blessing to another degree of blessing. So say this word with me, better. Everything that God's moving us into is going to be better. Amen. And so the Lord really instructed me, even for the other campus, to, through the word, get people ready for this shift. In other words, we've got to be conditioned with the word of God for the direction that God's taking us into. There's two words that have come into my spirit, shift and merge, <laughs> shift and merge. And so that's about to take place. There is a good direction coming for us uh, as, as a church, you know, as the body of Christ in general in this nation, there's a shift coming. 
you know, want to talk about the shift on different levels. So we talked about it in the level of this church. We know that. You can feel that. But I can also feel in my spirit, not just as a pastor, but just prophetically, I can feel there's a change coming with the, the influence of the church in the land. The influence of the church in the land and our nation and in the world. There's going to be, a, you know, and they're trying to get rid of that influence. If you, if you can't see that, they're, they're trying to delete uh, so many different things, cancel so many different things. You've heard the word cancel culture. Well, this isn't new concerning the church. This started when Jesus came into the earth. You had Herod who wanted, he was an immediate opponent of Jesus, wanted to find out where the baby was. Why? Because he didn't want the birth of the church to come into the earth through the form of a, 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 the son of God. You don't think the devil knows what's going on? He knows what's going on. He, that's why he's grasping at certain things. This ain't about, you know, canceling statues and just history. This is about the church. And if they can condition the world through little things like that, they'll get into the history of the church and try to cancel out the church before you know it. And then there'll be church people that think the, en- the church is the enemy. You know, so there you go. You know, you, you know, parents are now the enemy. You can't go to a, a PTA or a board meeting and, and, and talk about how, you know, y- what's going on and how your kids are being influenced with certain things that are being talked about in schools. You got teachers that are taking kids to gay bars and diff- different things like that. I've seen that in the news. Maybe not bars. You can't take kids to a bar, but introducing them into the normalcy of what they, they, they think it should be normal now. You know, I, I made a just a, just kind of a funny statement, but it's true. You know, when are we going to see in the next month or, or so transgender, transgender San, Santa? You know, because they're trying to shift your thinking into a new way of thinking. It's just a joke. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But, you know, uh, they want you to be conditioned into thinking certain things are all right. And according to the Bible, see, it's really an attack on Bible standards and holiness and Bible truths. There are certain things that just aren't all right. Right. And, you know, early on in the scriptures, you see God dealing with even this, you know, homosexual thing in Sodom and Gomorrah. So it was something that God dealt with early on. And, uh, you know, so there's so much, there's a lot to say about that. We're not going that direction, but there is a shift going on in the church where our influence is going to be, is going to be really uh, powerful in a sense where it's going to turn heads. It's going to turn heads even on a national level and in a, in a level of, of uh, the government as well. Amen. We, as long as the Holy Ghost is here, then the church is here. Hallelujah. And as long as the church is here, then uh, we're, we're feared by the enemy. I will tell you that because he knows he's already defeated. And the greatest fear that the enemy has is that you get revelation of who you are. Because once you find out who you are, then you're, you're an opponent to him and to his agenda. And so if you can't see that there is a, a specific, we just talked, we touched on a couple things just right there. But if you can't see that there's a specific agenda in the earth that the enemy has right now, that it's not just a party. This is the enemy. This is, this is demonic, diabolic stuff that's being spewed out that's not normal and is being accepted by people that once were normal in some of their beliefs. If you can't see that, then something's wrong. Um, you know, in today's culture, if, if there was David and Goliath in today's culture, the church of today would say, we don't, need to, we don't need to slay, we need to pray. They would have you praying for Goliath instead of slaying Goliath. And that's a problem. I said, that's, that's a problem, see? Because when a, when a church is... Understand, when they understand that they're anointed, I'm not even in what I'm preaching on today, but I hope you're getting something out of it. When you understand that you're anointed, when there are enemies to the anointing, the anointing will break them. Because once the enemy becomes a yoke or a burden, the anointing is designed to remove burdens and destroy yokes. That's a great confession for you to walk around and say, I'm anointed. 
And you know, if there's threats on your job and you have a faith confession that you're anointed and they want to threaten you, it's more than just a building of a church. You are the church. And that's what David said. He said, you're coming against God. You're not coming against me. And that's what all these threats and mandates are really doing. They're coming against God. All right, praise the Lord. I'm not, I don't want to rant and rave on that all day, but I, I do want to say this. God it is really, there's a shift going on in the church, and I truly believe it's going to be here sooner than you think on a national level, and the church is going to have a voice of influence that's going to turn heads. I prophesy that to you. It's going to, and, and we're not turning heads with the, the, the fog and, and smoke machines. and all, it's, That's not turning heads. That's the tolerance circle. I don't want to be a church that tolerates. You know, we need to love, and I agree with love. Faith works by love. I'm not saying that, that but, you know, if you, if you would have told David you need to love Goliath. and pl- No, it was the plan of God for Goliath to be slain. And I'm not talking we're going on a slaying mission. I'm not saying that. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But I don't think we ought to tiptoe around the devil. I'm telling you that right now. I don't think we ought to be soft. You know, I was was listening to an interview. I think it was with Tom Brady. You know, I watch football. So he goes, the reason why I probably could play till I'm 50 is because the league's gotten so soft. He goes, back 20 years ago, it wasn't so soft. You know, you can't even hit a quarterback now. You can't even, you, you know, you, you, even if they're past the line of scr- scrimmage, you try to tackle them, they blow the whistle while he's standing up tall. They're afraid. You can't hit nobody. Same with Little League Baseball. Everybody gets a prize. You can't slide a certain way no more. We've taken the physicality out of it, and we're, we're really turning a, a lot of our young men into sissies because the devil wants to demasculinize people. Men especially. They've got classes at a university level teaching how to demasculinize people. Or men, not just people, men. Right? Well, I think women ought to be feminine, and I think men ought to be masculine. And I think that men are built that way and designed that way and equipped that way by God. Hallelujah. Anyway, praise the Lord. And so if it, you know... Moral of the story is, if it looks like a duck, <laughs> quacks like a duck, all right? So anyway, moving right along, praise the Lord. Y'all getting anything out of this before I even got into my text? Praise the Lord. So we're not against people, but I am, gonna, I am going to firmly stand against letting something in to my heart that is diabolic. Don't tell me that, you know, we, we ought to accept all these certain things that are being said, talked about, these beliefs that are being infiltrated into people's minds and hearts. You wouldn't stand in front of your house, leave a door open, let a bunch of varmints and skunks in. And so don't do the same when it comes against some of this ideology that straight from the pit of hell, that if it gets in your heart, it'll be a little bit of leaven, and a little bit of leaven makes bread all puffed up but really it's full of air and CO2 and sodium and all that other stuff when you'd be better off eating unleavened flatbread. All right? Praise the Lord. Praise, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whether you're stirred up or pulling, I'm stirred up and something's pulling on the inside of me. Hallelujah. So you might get a little bit of the Holy Ghost and a lot of it, I should say, Hallelujah. this morning, whether you want it or not. Hallelujah. And so the devil knows that God has something big for you, big for the church, so big that it's going to usher in this second, the second, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan knows his time's about up. And so he'd rather other things enter into your heart to keep you from walking in the bigness of God. Hallelujah. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Um, but if you stay small-minded, you'll never walk in it, and his, his agenda is to keep you small-minded. Look at this. Look in the Scripture. Can you put that up on the screen? Let's read this in the, uh, uh, the Message Bible. He said, sing, barren woman. So you can sing as a man, too. This is just an illustration. He says, this woman who's never had a baby filled the air with song, you who've never experienced childbirth. In other words, if you've been believing God for some things, let's just 
let's just put it on an equal level here for everybody. So it's not just talking about physical childbirth. But if you're believing God for something and you want that to manifest, then singing would be praising, right? And there's something that praise and faith does, uh, you know, towards bringing you to the end of your faith. And he's saying, those of you that have never uh, had a baby, get ready. You're about to see some manifestation. You're about to see some change. You can say it like this, for those of you that have had a dry season, or for the church, it looks like it's been a, 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 a dry season. Get ready. There's a shift coming, and you're about to deliver some things into the earth. God's saying, I'm about to deliver some things through my church and through my body in this nation. I'm about to change some things. You're about to see some change. You're about to see a shift. You're about to see some things being birthed out. You might have seen some things in your spirit. I've talked to many of you, and you, you've seen, you know, some things that God showed you. And uh, others may have laughed at you, and others may have said, well, you might be, you might be bordering on the, uh, uh, on the edge of being a conspiracy theorist. You ever heard that? But God has really shown you some things, and, and other prophets in the land. Come on, somebody. I mean, it can't be that everybody's missing it. There's some confirmation that we're hearing about some things that are going to be brought forth and that are going to come into the earth. And uh, you can't take that lightly. You've you, you got to keep that, that uh, promise or that vision that you have, you know, cultivated and stirred up on the inside of you because God's about to bring some things to pass. Remember, they all laughed at Noah. What was he doing? He's building an ark. Why? Because... He's seen something. God spoke to him. And in today's day, they would, have, uh, they, they would have blacklisted him. They would have said, you're a conspiracy theorist until the flood came. And then when the flood came, they'd be running after that ark trying to get in it. Well, that's what's going to happen in this nation. There's a flood that's about to come. There's a shift that's about to come. And the church, if you'll hop on board with what the word of the Lord is saying, praise God, you'll be safe in the ark of God's power and his presence. Even if it gets worse in the world, you're going to turn heads in the nation and they're going to be directed to the Jesus in you. Hallelujah. And they're going to put aside all all the junk that they've been hearing from all these diabolically used people and voices in the earth. Man, I tell you, <laughs> if you haven't been delivering, get ready. You're about to have a baby. That's what he's saying right here. Get ready. There's about to be a shift. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Can you put that back up on the screen if you would? Let's read the uh, next few verses. He said, fill the air with song. You've never experienced childbirth. You're going to end up having far more children than all those childbearing women. God says so. Underline that. God says so. Uh, I mean, really, write that down in your notes. God says so. Get that stamped in your heart. God says so. You've been believing God for something, and you've kept that, you know, on the inside of your heart, and you've protected that, and you know it's coming to pass, but you haven't shared it with everybody. Just write it down in your notes. God says so. And if God says so, it shall come to pass. Hallelujah. I said it shall come to pass. You can't get more powerful than that. God says so. So at next time you see something going in the wrong direction, just be comforted with those words. God says so. If you see something on the job going in the wrong direction, just know and have a peace that God says so. Come on, you know the doctor may have given you a bad report, but you have an understanding that you're healed in your body. Just have that comfort on the inside of you knowing that God says so. It may look like you're surrounded, hallelujah, but you're more surrounded by something you can't see hallelujah there's more with you than there are against you because God says so say that out loud with me God says 
so you got a dream you got a you, you know you've got a, a vision on the inside of you and you've protected that dream and God's shown you some things and it looks bigger than what you can do in the natural you don't have the money for it but you've got the dream for it remember God says so and that's all you need to know I said that's all you need to know what what does God say what is God saying He's saying there's a shift coming, and it may be uncomfortable to your flesh, but be ready. God says so. Well, what does God say? God says you're going to have more children than what, than what you ever imagined. In other words, what God's going to birth in your life is exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ever ask or think. Like one preacher would always say, get ready, get ready, get ready. Because what God's about to do is bigger than you think. Hallelujah. Now look here what he says. He's saying clear lots of ground. You see that? Clear lots of ground. For what? For your tents. Make your tents large. Spread out. Think big. Use plenty of rope. Drive the tent pegs deep. You're going to need lots of elbow room for your growing family. You're going to take over whole nations. Wow. You're going to resettle abandoned cities. God never called me just to one city. If you're hooked up to this ministry, you're not hooked up to this ministry just because God called us to one city. I tell you what, God's going to allow us to be influential to many cities, to many nations. That's part of the plan of God. He said, don't be afraid. You're not going to be embarrassed. I love this. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. Don't hold back with your faith. You believe in God for something? Then take it up a few notches. Let's say you believe in God for, for uh, uh, something that costs $10,000. Go ahead and believe for the 20. Double it. Hallelujah. Shoot for the moon. If you make it halfway, then you did pretty good. That's what one person said. But go ahead because you serve a God who is above and beyond, exceedingly, abundantly, above all you could ever ask or think, that's what he wants to do in your life. Hallelujah. That's what he wants to do in your business. Yes. That's what he wants to do in your family. Yes. That's what he wants to do in your ministry. That's what he wants to do in the all-call tour. You know, you're always going to have a Judas. You're always going to have a Judas in the mix. You just always will. That's going to say, well, I can't believe you have, a, you have an event and you give away all that money. That must have cost you twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000. You could have done other things. You know, we, I've heard from people on the other campus that said, you know, you could have paid my bills. You could have paid my gas bill. You could have done this. You could have helped the whole congregation. But you don't see what's going on. All you can think about is yourself instead of being eternal-minded. Eternal Come on, somebody. And you're no different than Judas. And it's a spirit in the church that small-mindedness spirit, stingy devil, come on somebody, they get upset when someone takes the offering even, they go to the bathroom and hide out during offering time because they know something on the inside of them gets mad every time and it's a demon trying to keep you poor and keep you broke and that demon it is in cities. It's in regions. That's why you see some cities that have a spirit of poverty on it and you don't want to go down certain streets because people carry the same ideology, that same poor spirit, come on, and you've got to be careful that don't get in you. You've got to be careful that don't get in you. We'll get into more of that. Are you all getting something out of this today? Glory to God. That means if you've got someone that's got that poor spirit, you say, well, how can I tell if they got it? By the way, they talk. Number one. Number two, if they still got their Christmas tree lights up from last year and the tree in there, then they probably got a poverty spirit too. Come on. It's true. If you're mad at me right now, then you might have your tree up still. That's okay if you love Christmas that much. I get that. But you know, I went into, years ago, I had my business. And just to take a side note, we did blinds and carpet, and I had some accounts, and we did, uh, we did carpet, and we replaced blinds in an apartment complex. It was in a bad part of town. And, but it, it was a blessing to me. It was like bread and butter because they'd always call me when something was broke, and it was always broke at this part of town. So, 
Every tenant broke everything, pretty much. And so I got called, went into one house one time, and it was July, and they had a live Christmas tree that was as brown and rust-colored as you'd ever seen sitting in the corner of that room. They kicked out the tenant, but the tree was still there. And, and the Lord showed me right away. He said, it's, it's not that they're lazy. There's a spirit of poverty on them. He goes, watch that that don't get in you. And, I, and then the Lord began to show me certain things in my own house that, you know, natural things I needed to deal with. Deal with that. Deal with this. Deal. You ever watch that show, Hoarders? Yeah, I stopped watching it. My wife used to watch the seasons of it. And I said, we got to stop watching that. That'll get in you. Right. People collect things. And i got family members that have garage sales. Every, it, it, they, they go out and buy a ton of stuff. They might not even wear it and ends up in a garage sale. I, said, I thought, that you be, better be careful. I knew one pastor that they always raised their money on garage sales, and I thought, I don't ever want to use a garage sale to, to try to build a church. It should be built through the tithes and offerings of the increase of the people, not through some poverty hand-me-down. Uh, I ain't, I, you understand what I'm saying? God didn't call you to be, you know, have a rummage spirit. He called you to have a, a prosperity. Now, I'm not telling you that if you don't have a lot, you cannot have a lot and have a spirit of prosperity on you. You understand what I'm saying? So anyway, how did I get off on that? Well, what he's saying here is if you're getting ready for what I'm about to do in your life, then you're going to have to clear lots of land. You're going to have to make preparation for more. You're going to have to get some storehouses. If you really believe, saith the Lord, that I'm going to fill your storehouses, how many of them you got? In other words, get plenty of rope. Get some, some pegs and start, you know, putting them in deep. Why? Because there's some strong winds coming and you're building a big structure and you want it to hold to capacity, hallelujah, with the ability to, to, to bring in lots of people. He's not just talking to us this way, uh, 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 you know, as a church, you know, local church level, but you individually, what has God shown you in your heart? Get, make preparation for God to move in those areas in your life. Get plenty of rope. Think big. And don't allow certain people to come in and get you to think small. Hallelujah. I have learned that there's certain ways to go home. Because there are certain streets, if you look at it all, all the time, it, it, <laughs> it'll get in your visual. And then if you get it in your visual, it goes from there and it can get into your heart. And you can almost think that things will never change and it's always going to be like that. And then you see it and say, well, if they don't change, I'm not going to change. If they're not going to mow their lawn, I'm not going to mow my lawn. If they're going to park five cars on their front yard, then I'm going to have five cars on my front yard, not on the driveway, on the grass. You understand what I'm saying? And so it's easy to adapt to certain things because it's all you see. And sometimes you've got to violate that and start seeing some new things. Sometimes you've got to drive down Rodeo Drive just to get a vision of prosperity, Come on. figuratively speaking and, you know, naturally speaking too. Because if you've got a problem with prosperity, you're going to have some problems with God when you get to heaven. He said, well, what do you mean about that? Let's talk about that. Well, we could, but I got other stuff to talk about. But there are streets made of gold. What about that, huh? I mean, not asphalt, not the kind you have to, you know, redo every five years if there's enough funding that they didn't put over to all these Planned Parenthood groups and other people. Gold. Gates made of one pearl. You're going to be there for an eternity. What, what happened to the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. Is that not clear to you? That whatever his will is in heaven, that's his will on the earth? Is there, is there any plan for there to be any streets that have these supposed mansions that Jesus is supposedly preparing for us to be on streets of asphalt? 
No, streets of gold. Come on, we got scripture on that. If we believe the scripture, there's no poverty in heaven. It's only prosperity. So make plans to have heaven on earth right here. Thank you for your enthusiasm. You know, there's some places you can't preach that. Why? Because they've got so much in their heart, uh, you know, against that. Again, because maybe they've seen people misuse or abuse, which, is, which happens, correct? But it doesn't change the truths in the word of God. And so anytime you see God wants me wealthy, you have to ask yourself, why and for what? And then you make provision to be activated in the assignment of that. Why does God want me wealthy? To establish his kingdom on the earth. So now I'm going to make plans to get busy in the kingdom. How can I be a blessing? Well, first and foremost, if you're going to be a blessing, the Bible teaches to the household of faith. What's that? That's the house of faith that you belong to. Contribute and support that. I'm going to talk about that so that we can break the back of people's poverty thinking because until you get involved in the house that God's hooked you up with, then you won't tap into the shift that he has for you financially, which includes a transfer of the wealth of the wicked. Hallelujah. I didn't plan on talking about that, but that's so good. God wants you blessed for a purpose and a reason. Make plans to be activated in that ministry. You say, it's a ministry? Yes, it's a ministry. So now if you're going to get ready for the bigger and all you do is work at a, at a hamburger flipping joint or whatever, no shame in whatever you put your hands to, just see what you got your hands to as a ministry and then when God's hooked up with what you're doing, come on somebody, I have never had any shame in anything I put my hands to. As long as I knew that God had his hands on it, he would take me from one level of increase to another. There ain't no shame if you work at Walmart. There ain't no shame if you work at, uh, at a place that some people would deem as lower. But where the shame is, is when you shame yourself and belittle yourself and don't see that God is with you. When God's with you, there's an anointing on you at Walmart. There's an anointing on you at McDonald's. There's an anointing on you in a sales position. There's an anointing on you on the streets as a police officer. There's an anointing on you as someone that has branded, uh, you know, a clothing ministry or whatever you put your hands to. When you see God is with me, hallelujah, then you've got an assignment to prepare for something big. Because anything that God does, it's big. You have to have a spirit of prosperity in these last days because what God's going to do, it's big. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's big. Hallelujah. So he says, spread out. Think big. Spread out. Think big. Get big, strong, deep pegs. Glory to God. Why would you need that? Because your tent's bigger. If you've got a one-man tent, then you have these little plastic you know, stakes. But if you've got a, if you've got a fifth wheel, then, then there's some anchoring down, right? And there's, some, there's some, some of those stands that they have out there to keep it braced, different things like that. The bigger you get, the more bracing that needs to take place. What's he saying? Get ready. Hallelujah. Build your foundations deep because I'm taking you to a higher place. Hallelujah. hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. You know, uh, if, if you're a mountain climber, which I'm not, but maybe some of you have, or there's people that tackle like Mount Whitney or different places where they're really high. They have to stop at certain elevations. Did you know that? And sometimes stay the night. Sometimes they've got to uh, stay two days, three days. Why? Because they need their oxygen levels to get used to that altitude. In other words, If their oxygen levels aren't used to the higher altitude, if they'd even tried to go higher, they'd pass out and die. And God showed me this. He goes, I want your faith level on the inside to be so acclimated for what I'm about to do. You won't be able to climb higher until you see the bigger on the inside of you. 
you, ain't, you won't be able to, to uh, shift when I say shift unless your heart is ready for the shift. Right? And so just like an, a, a, a mountain climber has to breathe, a believer has to believe. To be able to walk in areas that God has for you, it takes faith. The just shall live by faith. And some things you see in the spirit, you see yourself going to certain places or doing certain things or having things in your life or, or doing certain things in the ministry. There's, there's development time. There's character development. There's faith development. Just like there's a oxygen development for the mountain climber so he can go higher. There's, in other words, this time, Wednesday night time, Study time, in the Word, every night, that's not lost time. When you wake up early and you're meditating and you're getting certain things on the inside of you, that's not wasted time. That's not just personal devotion time. That's you and the Holy Ghost together working on some things on the inside because He's expanding you there first. He's expanding your faith first. Because if you want to walk in what he has for you that's bigger, you're going to have to have something bigger on the inside of you. And you have the help of the Holy Spirit, come on somebody, who will illuminate, reveal, and take this scripture and make it alive in your spirit. Come on. And, and, and breed faith in your heart for what's ahead. He's in you. He's a person. He's the helper. He's the Holy Ghost. And you walk with him. And he wants to talk with you. And he wants to tell you what's in this word because faith comes where the will of God is known. And you won't walk these things out unless there's faith. God said, I, I, you know, he told a, a, a revivalist of old, he said, I can't seem to do anything in the earth except to have a man and can use him. And God is looking for yieldedness, responsiveness. He, he's wanting you to respond. You know, when I say, repeat after me, or say amen, or say, say this to your neighbor, that, that's, sometimes you might think, well, that's just a cliche, and I don't have to do that. I can do it. I'm free to do it. And you are. That's true. But what you don't understand is we're practicing on response, being responsive. Come on. We're practicing how to respond. Because if I say, say amen, you have to respond to say that. And if you say, well, I don't have to, well, then automatically there's, there, there, you can see there's a wall you put up just concerning that. And if you put a wall with something that easy, how's it going to be when God tells you to do something that totally goes against your flesh? So start and, and learn to... I can go into some places and it's, it's like there's fumes in the atmosphere. You light one little match and it just blows up, I mean, in a good sense. So I, I can go to some places, it's just so e easy to preach because they're conditioned to respond. And we have to train ourselves to be responsive. When, when, when the minister says, lift up your hands and worship God, if you think, well, I don't have to, I'm free to do whatever I want, God sees my heart, Yes, he does, but what if God tells you to do something and you give him that response? So what we're doing is you're tra we're training you what responsiveness looks like so that when God tells you to do something, you have a trained way of how to put your flesh under because a lot of people, their flesh is what keeps them from doing certain things. Hallelujah. And so what we want to do is we want to be teachable. We want to learn. We want to learn how to be useful in the kingdom, how to be, you know, have a, have a sense of yieldedness because responsive people under, understand they have a responsibility. In other words, you can't be a responsible person without an assignment. Why would I give you an assignment if you don't respond? God wants to give you, come on. 
Some good stuff's flowing out of this. God wants to give you the responsibilities or the assignments that he's shown you in your heart, but until you learn how to be responsive, you won't <laughs> possess the responsibility of the assignment that he has for you. And with every responsibility and assignment he has comes increase. Hallelujah. That is so good. Hallelujah. So to do what you see, you have to walk it out. So it takes cooperation. It takes willingness. It takes belief. It takes responsiveness. It takes yieldedness. For God to move, you can see he needs you. He needs your heart. He needs his goodness to get into your heart so you can walk it out. So Amen. Now, let's, can I give you a couple steps here? Number one, follow the leading of the Spirit. Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. He's in you to help you and be responsive to that leading. Check this out. Look over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Hallelujah. Y'all get something out of this? Then say amen. 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 <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Look here. He says in verse 9, he says, But as it is written, I hath not seen, neither has ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man. Underline that right there. Neither has entered where? Into the heart of man. The things which God has prepared for them that love him. Okay? So, there's things that your natural eyes have yet to behold. There's things even your spiritual eyes, they've yet to behold. God wants to show you certain things, but you haven't seen them yet. This is what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. He's saying, I have things for you that I haven't even showed you yet. I've got some things that I've prepared for you. Do you love God? How many love God? He says he's prepared some things for those that love him, right? He said, I've got some things that I've prepared for you. You haven't even heard about those things yet. In other words, you haven't seen nothing yet, right? But notice the key. It says, neither have they entered into the heart of man. God wants to get them into your heart. Hallelujah. Remember, you know, Solomon, what did he say in Proverbs? He said, guard what? Your heart. your heart, for out of it flow what? The forces or the issues of life. Everything flows from that place. Everything good flows from the heart. Everything you need from God comes from the heart. Jesus said the kingdom is where? Within you. What he's saying is the realm of heaven, everything that heaven possesses, it's placed within you. Where's that at? It's in your heart. And God's saying, I want to show you some things, and the only way we can get these things out of you and get you flowing into you is I've got to get them through your eyes and get them through your ears. You've got to hear some things. And then when they get through your eye gates and through your ear gates, then I want them to enter into your heart. You know, it's, it's so important. I'll take a little rabbit trail here. This will help some people. Be careful what you allow to get into your heart. The devil will, think, will, will use certain things and you'll think, well, I have a right to feel this way. Be careful because you can get certain things in your heart even towards someone else and it gets you out of your love walk and it keeps what God wants in your heart from flowing in a big way. Don't allow strife to get in your heart. Don't allow bitterness to get in your heart. He, he, he knows that if he can just get a little bit of that, remember we're talking about leaven? If he can just get a little leaven in your heart, what, what is a little bit of... A little bit of yeast or a little bit of rice or a little bit of baking soda. What does it do to dough? It affects the whole dough, right? It affects the whole appearance of, of the dough. And it turns into something more than what it's supposed to be. And so what he's saying is don't allow certain things to get in your heart because it will affect the whole batch in your life. 
It'll affect your whole vision. It'll affect my plan that I have for you. So even if you think you have a right to be mad about something or upset or ticked off about something or you feel like I've been done wrong, be careful. The devil will use that. In other words, learn this responsive thing to where you'll say, I'm going to violate that. You said the word violate today. And I'm going to walk in love on purpose. In fact, I remember one preacher that some things were being said bad against him. He started the church, you know, down the street from this other pastor. He didn't even know him, but they were saying real bad things about him. And he said, I'm going to violate what I want to do to respond to those words. And I'm going to go ahead and send him a check. And he did, and that riff was immediately over because some people money speaks loudly, I guess. But for the other preacher that wrote the check, it got him out of a position where he rightfully, you know, could have been mad because of the things that were said. You don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to vindicate yourself. All you got to do is keep eternity before you because some of these things we get mad over aren't eternal things anyway. They're carnal, natural things. They're stupid stuff that are going to burn and melt with fire anyway later on. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's good. Thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> All right, praise God. Can we move on? Notice he says, neither has entered into the heart of man. In other words, I want to get some things into your heart. Because from there, that's where life comes from. That's what it flows from. And then he says, but God's revealed them to us. Revealed what to us? The things that he wants your eyes to see. The things that he wants to get into your heart. That he's prepared for you. He reveals them to us. How? By his spirit. Right? For the spirit searcheth all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. What is the function or the job of the agent? I call him an agent in the earth the Holy Ghost. His job is to reveal to your heart, get it into your heart first, everything that God has prepared for you. Right? In other words, God's preparing a shift for his church in the earth. And it's a good shift. It's a, it's a shift in authority. It's a shift in power. It's a shift with our voice. It's, a, it's stepping up in faith. It's stepping up in miracles, all these things. So if he's prepared that for us, what's our job? To have a personal relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit so that he can speak to us and reveal to us those things and the steps we're supposed to take. Glory to God, because he knows more than you. Well, that's a Hallelujah. good thing to learn. Right. He knows the mind of God. What man knows the things of God? But the Spirit. The Spirit of God himself. He knows the mind of God. Why? Because he is God. He's the third person of the Godhead, so he's deity. He's 100% God. He's in you. He abides in you forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before you go Google search something, before you go to man, before you go to a, a doctor, I'm not against that. Go to the person of the Holy Ghost so he can reveal to you truth. Amen. That way, when you do Google search something, you can differentiate whether that's true or not because there's a liar out there. Who is he? He's the defeated one, right? Yep. But if he can lie to you and get you to believe in direction with what he's saying, then he can use that authority, which is yours, to defeat you and destroy you. Come on, somebody. Y'all, y'all... I can tell you're getting something out of this. This is good stuff. So allow the Holy Spirit to enlarge your insides. Allow the Holy Ghost to stretch your insides. Allow him to reveal to you 
what's ahead. Don't, don't back off. If he's showing you some things and people are laughing at you, or, then quit talking to them. You don't cast your pearl before swine anyway. That's what they are. Laughers and scorners are swine. They're dogs. Dogs are good to pet. You can pet them and text them and, and have, befriend them, but don't share your precious stuff that God shows you. Right? In other words, dogs I can throw scraps to, but I don't throw them the remote control because they don't know the difference between the, the, the remote control and scraps. They'll eat that just, to, you know, I had a fan controller and I had to find that fan controller. It took forever to do it, but the dog ate that. Don't know the difference between that and the bone. And so just one costs more. You see what I'm saying? And there's some things that are, that are priceless. They're, they're costly that God reveals to you. And you don't just share that with every Tom, Dick, and Harry. You guard, you guard those things. You, you, you don't allow everybody into your holy of holies. There, you know, I've got different levels of relationship. I got me and my wife. We're at one level that y'all can't get in, never. And I don't want in your level with your spouse either. I don't want, I don't want to go there. I, I'm, I'm not an officer of the law either, so don't call me every time you get in an argument. Let me supernaturally pastor people. I, you know what I'm saying? I don't want to decide what, which way the toilet paper goes on your, in your bathroom, whether it goes on the outside or the inside. I had one person want to counsel and talk about that one time. Well, I'm leaving him. I don't like the fact that he has the toilet paper going this way. I want it going under. I'm thinking, that's stupid. Quit calling me on that. Just leave each other. <laughs> You're just looking for an excuse to leave, so just leave anyway. Right. Right. By that time, they get mad at you, and they say, I can't believe you talked to me that way. And they ended up staying together usually. You, get, you shock them enough and think you, 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 they realize how stupid they are. Come on. You understand what I'm saying? And so, how to get off on that? <laughs> Glory to God. We take our counsel from the Holy Spirit. We take our direction from the Holy Spirit. And if it don't line up with that, we make a decision, I'm going with truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, the Spirit of God will show you something oftentimes that goes beyond the natural. He goes beyond what you're used to. He'll go in a new direction or a new way. You brought it out in Luke chapter 5. You didn't know we were going to bring that out in today's text. But I, I actually, we don't have to go there. We'll paraphrase through it. But he was talking about that during the offering. He said, Jesus said, you know, he's, he's preaching at the lake of Gennesaret, right? And he asked them for their boat. Well, you know, one of the things that made Peter so reluctant to respond is because Peter is a fisherman. And as a fisherman, he knows what time to fish. You, you know what I'm saying? You know, I know certain fishermen. I, you, we, we did our men's conference, and some of you are thinking, man, Pastor always catches. Well, I have an uncle that I talk to that catches every time he goes out. And he fishes Convict Lake all the time. And he told me years ago, he said, now there's a ridge out there and there's a certain time if you cast off into that ridge and let your line go down 50 feet. Now, that's never left me. And that's why I caught so many this last trip right there on that ridge. Because he told me that years ago. He knew what time they catch. He's been doing it for years. He knew how deep to go. He knew the location where they hang out. Now, do you think Jesus knows certain things beyond the expertise of Peter? Yeah, but Peter in his pride is thinking, you're Jesus, you're a teacher, you're, you know, miracle worker, and we've been with you and seen all that, but you're not a fisherman. Right. Right. I'm a fisherman. I do this all the time. This is my job. You got to be careful that you don't put Jesus on a level of familiarity right. to where you have exalted your expertise and what you've studied and what you're perfect at and what you're good at so that when Jesus tells you do this and it's contrary to the way you think, you still go the professional route instead of the supernatural route. What Peter was saying is, I know more than you. We fished all night. We fished at the right time. The fish were supposed to bite, and they didn't bite. We've put all our tackle and our nets, we put them aside. We put everything away. I'm done fishing. Don't tell me to take my boat and cast my net over here on the other side or launch out into the deep. But he said, nevertheless, at thy word, I'll do what you say. 
Now, mind you, they did have a net-breaking catch, but the nets were never supposed to break. If a net breaks, you don't get everything you were supposed to get. That's why Jesus said, let your nets out. So I'm convinced, along with Kenneth Copeland, that Peter took his worst net, the net that was broken down, that was rotted out, and said, go ahead and try this. And that's the way people are with Jesus they and their faith. They've got him on such a carnal level, and they live on such a carnal level that they know more than God. So they think, well, if God can do it, then do it with this. Instead of giving God their best, because that's what faith will do. Man, I'm out of time already, and I didn't even get into the leaven part of this. So what did, what did Peter do? He said, I'll give you one net. If he would have had two nets, then it wouldn't have broke. The next time when Jesus said, cast your net on the other side, Peter was out there cooking, having a barbecue with fish. And he seen Jesus, Jesus and recognized it, and he's shouting out from the shore, cast your nets on the other side. And what did he do? He took his clothes off and went skinny dipping and ran out there to Jesus. Literally. Because there wasn't one sense of reluctancy. You know something about that, Lloyd, right? Not reluctancy, but the other thing. <laughs> I got to get him. <laughs> there, there wasn't one sense of hesitation because he learned his lesson. The first time, what did he do? What did, G what did Peter do the first time? Peter fell at his feet. And he said, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. He just got increased. Why would he say he was sinful? He, he had unbelief. He had unbelief. Can I close with a certain thought? Lloyd, I love you. I just, that's, if I do that to you, Lloyd, no one really knows, only a few people, what I'm talking about. It's, it's because I really do love you and... You might be one of my favorites, but I've told so many people that that uh, don't take that serious either. Okay, let me give you just a food for thought, and we'll keep this going another time. Y'all getting something out of this? Because I, I want to wrap this up. But look here in, uh, go to Mark's chapter, or Mark's gospel, chapter 8. Mark's gospel, chapter 8, verse 13. Jesus, with his disciples, had just pulled off <laughs> one of the, the grandest events, miracles, man, that took place, the feeding of the 5,000 families. You, you remember hearing about that? I mean, he took a little boy's lunch. Now, he knew what he was going to do. He was going to take that little boy's lunch and multiply it and feed 5,000 families. Glory to God, that's more than 5,000 people. That's, that's a lot of people. He knew what he was going to do, but he was testing, right? He said, he said where are we, we going to find food? And one of his disciples said, well, we don't have much money, right? But Jesus knew there was a little boy that had a lunch that he could multiply. And someone said, well, we have this young man. He's got a lunch, but it's not enough for this many. And Jesus said, bring him to me. And he took the loaves and he took the fishes and he multiplied all of that and fed 5,000 people. Now, if you were there, would that have impacted you? I mean, you know, saying it right now, I mean, if you see something like that, would that have just drastically impacted even your faith? And your, I've seen some things. I've seen people raised from the dead that have been out for a while. I uh, had a relative that, you know, had died twice, and family was saying, pray, 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 and we, we stood there until he came back, and then uh, I've seen blind eyes open, seen many, many miracles, I've seen tumors the size of pumpkins just go down overseas, all kind of stuff, and it impacts you, and I know a lot of people that have seen that stuff impacted them for a moment, but then when they had a need, they forgot the loaves and the fishes, can I talk about that just for one second? Why did these same disciples, which they had a food need, they had a food shortage, the supply chain, you've heard that? <laughs> there was a supply chain problem. They're going to the other side again in the boat with Jesus, and they didn't bring enough food for everybody. So we got a supply chain problem. And in this chapter, Jesus, he knows what he's going to say again. Look here, it says, he left them 
he entered into the ship again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. So there's a breakdown of the supply chain. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them saying, take heed. Listen to this. He said, take heed. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Boy, that's, there's a lot in that. We're going to get into that. Notice what he said. And they reasoned among themselves saying, it is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he said unto them, why reason ye because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not, neither understand. Have ye your heart uh, yet hardened? In other words, did you harden your heart? Having eyes, see ye not? Ears, hear ye not? Do you not remember when I broke the five loaves among the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments you took? And they said unto him, 12. And when the seven among the 4,000, how many baskets full of fragments you took up? And they said, seven. And he said unto them, how is it that you do not understand? So now they got a food shortage on another trip. And they're complaining about food. And Jesus is saying, your heart's hardened. You forgot. You were all there when I multiplied the loaves and the fishes. In other words, I can do it again, but now because of your unbelief, how did unbelief come? He said, beware of the leaven of what? Not just Herod, but he said the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Let's stop and think about this. Who was Herod? Well, at that day, he was a, he was a political figure, right? What was the assignment of Herod early on? The assignment of Herod was to uh, find out where baby Jesus was. Why? Because we're going to have our first uh, planned parenthood event. Right? And now, listen, this 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 is the leaven of today. Okay? As a church, you gotta be careful that you don't adopt certain ideologies that are out there. The leaven of the government. What kind of leaven? Fear. Fear of what? A virus. What virus? I don't know. There will be a new one tomorrow. But there's all kind of viruses you can't see. You were never afraid of them two years ago. But all of a sudden, there's enough leaven that's being spewed out through... Media, airwaves, come on somebody, and that's gotten into some of the church. We're afraid of something that Jesus already took on the cross 2,000 years ago. Come on. Come on. We're afraid to the point where we're running after a jab. Which... If you don't get the jab, we're going to take away your job. And so what are they trying to do? They're trying to get you fearful. They're trying to move you. They're trying to influence you. With what? A little bit of leaven, and that's the problem. Leaven will take a lump of dough and puff it up, change its appearance. We don't just have the leaven of Herod. We've got the leaven of religious people. We've got the leaven of religion. We've got churches that are puffed up, look real good, fog machines, have good worship. You feel a little tickle. You feel a little emotion. It feels good. There's just so much energy, but there's no power at all there's no change at all it's puffed up the crust looks good but it's full of hot air what is Jesus saying he's saying if you're not careful what influenced you years ago come on I know people that were raised in Pentecost I know people that were raised in services where they seen miracles they came to some of our services and they man I ain't been in a service like that in 30 years and they loved it so much but they never come back why because they've been influenced by the leaven of religion and don't realize we're coming into a shift and a turn where we're getting back to Pentecost and getting back to miracles and getting back to the power of God and getting back to real church where people are changed and we're not, 
We're, we're not moved by speaking in other tongues and ashamed of certain manifestations that go on and, and embarrassed by it. We're embracing it because we realize it's the power of God. And the only thing is the power of God that can change our nation today, change our cities today, change this universe. And it's going to have to happen through you and I. I know I'm shouting. I'm a little excited about this. But I've seen this over the last couple years. People that had standards have dropped them. People that have beliefs have softened them. People that were influenced by the power don't need it anymore. Why? Where's that leaven coming from? Well, could could be from the framework and the way the media has made the church appear to be. That now we're the enemies, now we're the terrorists. No different than Herod saying, this baby's the enemy, let's get rid of him. When Jesus was the joy that was to come into the world, Jesus was the power that was coming into the world. No different today. And if you allow that leaven to come in, I'll stop here, but if you allow it to come in, it will harden your heart. And when there's a hardened heart, you'll never embrace what God has next. It's one thing to have experienced God, but what's next in your life? What's next depends on how your heart is. Number one, what's in your heart? Number two, is your heart softened? Because if it's softened, there's responsiveness. Glory to God. And when the Holy Spirit leads you and moves you, even though it's painful to your flesh, (laughs) come on. I've been through change so many times, and when the Holy Ghost says there's some more change coming, I'm thinking, I don't want it if it looks like what it was before. But when you look back, change always brought increase. Right? It also also means there's some rolling up of the sleeves. (laughs) Right? There's some boots. There's some work. But he never gives you work without giving you the grace and the anointing to complete and do the work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You never get too old for the work of God. But you can get unresponsive. Come on. God's not done with you yet. There's someone that's even said that in their heart, thinking, I don't know if there's anything left for me. No, no, no. There is something but you stay softened, stay responsive. God has some big things. And there's a shift coming in a right direction. Amen. Just be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit because He will show you beyond your natural knowledge. God will use the foolish things to the world to confound the wise. He doesn't need man's wisdom. He doesn't, he doesn't need man's expertise We need God's expertise. Come on, there's a place for your wisdom. But that wisdom cannot interfere with the wisdom of God. If it does, you'll miss out on what's next. Amen? Don't ever allow anybody to influence you to go in an opposite direction from the wisdom of God. I don't care who they are, and what their uh, uh, certificates say on their wall. If God said it, then it shall be so in Jesus' name. And just keep flowing in that direction. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to stop right there. Did y'all get something out of that? Hallelujah. God, you're so good. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. You're preparing us for something big. You're preparing us for something that's large on a grand scale. And not to make us look better or bigger. Uh, It's to make Jesus shine brighter. Hallelujah. And you said, if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto you. I thank you, Lord, as Jesus is lifted up, as you are lifted up in this ministry. Lives will be affected and changed for your glory. Hallelujah. I see that. I see that. Yes, I see lives being changed and affected in every region. I thank you, Lord, that you have given our ministries a place of authority. Hallelujah. A place of authority where there's, where there's 
the boundaries that you've placed. Hallelujah. And with you, there's no limitations. The only limitations that, that we have are the ones we put on ourselves. So we will allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to us 